Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Welcome back, everybody, to Fighting on Film. Today, we bring you another fantastic guest to talk about one of the giants of the war movie genre. We are talking about 1977's A Bridge Too Far, and we are joined today with the comedian, author, history enthusiast, one half of the We Have Ways podcast, the pub landlord himself, Al Murray. Thanks for joining us. A total pleasure. Thanks for having me, chaps. Welcome, Al. Thank you. So, to kick off, what we frequently ask guests is when did you first see the film well i i saw this in the cinema when it came out my dad took me and the memory of going to see it is like one of my sort of um it's like my if I, marvel's here superhero origin story events in my life going to see this movie because my dad was a my uh, uh, dad uh, he's still with us but my dad was an airborne sapper um uh, um he did his national service as a regular sapper and i think he thought that was a little bit boring so he wanted to make life more ridiculous so he got in became became an airborne guy um and so knew a vast amount of the characters who'd who'd been there and there were guys in his there were guys in his uh, and he and he, he he was the oc of a um of a territorial uh um uh squadron field squadron i think um independent parachute squadron 131 anyway and he had guys in his in his troops who'd been at arnhem who'd been there and his uh, commanding officer had been there, was it was in the school on the bridge, Eric Mackay. Um, uh, he knew all these people. So he was obviously going to the cinema to make sure that, you know, um, that, uh, that, that, that the Richard Attenborough, Dickie Attenborough had, had, had touched the hem of parachute regiment and airborne forces legend, you know, that he'd, that he'd genuflected duly in front of the, 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 the story, you know, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and but my defining memory of going to see the movie is the scene the the the, the epic the, the climactic scene where Frost and the Frost and the guys at the bridge realise that they're screwed when the t- the Panzer comes over the bridge and they can't stop it you know and well well we're, we're going to talk about this scene <laughs> and my dad fulminated vehemently it's the wrong bloody tank is what he said <laughs> um at the, uh, 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 and that and that you know spell broken. Um, uh, the the sort of eight year old, however old I was, thrill of seeing a war movie was sort of then the, the, uh, shattered by my father's um, uh, pedantry and um, fury at the lack of realism in this movie. So, uh, and that that is that's sort of, and we were we went to Arnhem when I was fifteen. I did an O level history. I mean, I'm that I'm that old. I did an O level history project about the Battle of Arnhem. But you know, I went to the. National Archive or the Public Record Office as it was, and read the battle diaries and and got a got a great mark for it. But we went and we did the we did the walking the ground, the thing Jim, James Holland's always talking about on our podcast. Mm. We did that, you know. We you we we walked from uh, from Rankham or somewhere from one of the drop zones into into the village into Oosterbeek and realised it's a fair old stretch and yeah. and the and actually began to you know piece the battle together and i remember nearly being run over by a scooter on the bridge because i didn't understand dutch cycle lanes and uh, uh and so the place and and the movie are inextricably tied up with my sort of um uh, f- uh fandom of 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 military history rather i'm not i would never describe myself as a historian but i i'm sort of into it i'm a consumer of it certainly yeah. and that and this movie is responsible for that mm. Going with my dad, and I remember it being completely. It's a mind blowing movie for its scale. That's just sheer epic scale of the thing. I mean, it's Gandhi with tanks, right? Yeah. In terms of its scale, <laughs> um, but but the scale of the thing is just completely boggling, you know. Uh, and c- conveys the scale of what they were doing um, in the in the um, in the operation itself. Yeah, the sta- the the scale of it is phenomenal. It, it's yeah. pretty much unparalleled by almost anything other than Longest Day and a handful of others. Yeah. That's so interesting. It's the crux of your, oh, your interest in military history. Completely. I think we all have one of those like seminal sort of like moments where we light bulb clicks yeah. on them. It's there for yeah. life. But it's also, it's responsible for so much. You might, you know, it's responsible for the, when you start studying it properly, you've got to park the fact that the Nazis all 
have cool gear and that they look <laughs> yeah. they look terrific and their uniforms are snazzy and and they're clipped and they're and and they all know exactly what they're going to do and the americans are kind of gee whiz and and all that and the james khan sequence with the you know i remember being completely bamboozled by that when i was a kid mm. like well, why are we what's going on you know why are we telling this story what's happening you know yeah. um and I see why it's in there now as an adult, but like at the time being completely wrong footed by it. And so my that's my view of the Americans and the Brit my view of the British comes from all the, the way the officers are depicted and then a poor old humble infantryman going, Is it is all right, sir? If I, you know, and, and uh, you know, like the class stuff in it. Yeah, and all of those sort of tropes completely they're the things you have to sort of hack through mm. um uh in, in trying to get to grips with the you know, with with the history. Mm. Well it's fascinating on that level because obviously it's made in 1976 through to yep. 78. So it's calling on 30 years worth of British cinema yep. of, you know, of making war movies yeah. and American cinema of making war movies. So it's condensing all of those past tropes into one film yep. and distilling them into a form, which is it's modern, it's modern, it's modern epic cinema filmmaking because it's, you know, the scale is unparalleled, um, but it takes little bits and bobs and then Attenborough puts his own twist on things, which makes the film all the more interesting. I mean, it's striking that it's written by an American. Yep. Um, uh, William Goldman. Yeah, William Goldman. And who, you know, I'm sure people will have read, he writes really fascinatingly, but really, really interestingly about putting the movie together. Produced by an American, but, 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 and written by an American, but, but directed by a marquee British director. So, so, and because it's an Anglo um, American men on a mission film. You're gonna. It, it, it's going to necessarily have that clash happen in it. Yeah. Um. Uh, uh, that culture clash happen in it. So Attenborough gets off his chest how he feels about the British class system and war, and uh, Goldman gets off his chest how he feels about um America and war. Uh, at the same time, so, you know, he's arguably it's a Vietnam movie as much as it's anything else because after all, that's what's going on yeah. militarily. You know, isn't this all pointless? Is where the film the film ends. You know, with this sort of soft focus, poignant, pointless moment, which I remember as a kid thinking, "Oh, for God's sake, <laughs> I don't want this." <laughs> you know, I want. But more... I think it was ninety percent successful. Yeah, exactly. Like... I want more explosions. That's what I want when I was a kid. Interestingly, the film does end about fifteen minutes after it climaxes, Lord of the Rings style. Yeah, and it's it's literally just wrapping up at that point. And yeah. you know, there's numerous conversations, Connery and Bogard, all of them in the tower. Yeah, um, literally just wrapping up what it was trying to get across yeah. from the beginning through to the end. So as as an action film, you, you're left thinking, oh, oh, this is a weird ending to a yeah to a war film. Once you look deeper into it, it has those aspects from, mm. as you say, both Attenborough and, and the writers. Yeah, um, that are trying to have a little bit of commentary on various socio-political situations. Although, interestingly, pulls the action off. So the action is all pretty good because normally, you know, the criticism in cinema is very often that people who are desperate to say something through their movies tend to then muff the action because they're they're too mm. worried about laying on you the thing they want to get. Yeah, like show, not tell and all that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, um, that, you know, this is why I think this film stands up is that, that, that he manages to get all the plates spinning and it's a little over long, and I, mm. uh, and I do find the, the James Khan bit preposterous. Yeah. And of course, but it's in Ryan's book. It supposedly happened, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, and that's the story they decided to pick on because it makes it very human and it's, you know. Because for me, because it, stuck, it has to stick so rigidly to Cornelius Ryan's book, you know, there's all these other great works written about Arnhem that you could pull from. You know, you could pull from Arnhem Lift yeah. if you wanted. You could pull from The Cauldron. Yeah. You could make a really good narrative piece focusing on one action but they chose to yeah. go no we don't know the whole kit banging caboodle and unfortunately some bits just they don't hold up as well as they could but all in all it's still a horrendously watchable film you know nearly 50, nearly 50 years after the but for so many reasons because it's beautiful the colors of everything in it are, yeah. are absolutely extraordinary and he uh, quite clearly although he's you know Attenborough is Attenborough is you know, cards on the table. It's an anti-war film. He doesn't half love uniforms. He doesn't half half <laughs> love kit and gear and and you know the 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 khaki that the Brits are wearing um, in the opening scenes. Uh, uh, you know, which are the, where first Airborne are you know arguing about um, uh, you know Urk, the Urquhart Fuller, who's Urquhart and um, blah blah. Is Brian Urquhart the Fuller character, Major Fuller? 
They look they look amazing in their uniforms. Yeah. The, the khaki's so beautiful on screen, and the maroon pops, and 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 of course, I mean, I think one of the really interesting films about this is is this film. It doesn't happen too long after Bloody Sunday, and and uh, you know, um, the parachute regiment at this point, the maroon beret is arguably an entirely contentious item, mm. and uh, and particularly if you're if you're you know, let, 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 Dickie Attenborough is a is a is a Guardian readers filmmaker. If, we, if we're looking at looking at the world like that, if we have to, yep. so to do a thing where he's kind of arguably glorifying these people, I think is quite is to an extent he's glorifying them. Is, is extraordinary, really? That yep. that's a contentious symbol, and he really he he's really into it. And the first twenty minutes, if you like blokes in uniform, um, if if that's your thing, and and you know, I know. Um, you know, Dirk Burgo plays Browning as this absolute, you know, ocean going shit, and and on all that, and 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 the and you know, uh, uh, soundings indicate he may well have been exactly that. You know, mm. um, uh, although Bogard didn't didn't feel so, he was quite uncomfortable in the role. Yes, well, that's very interesting. Yes, he knew the, him. Massive... He knew, well, he met him during the war because he'd been on Monty's staff. Exactly, in huge controversy. Um, you know, the royal family wrote to protest and all this sort of stuff when the. Um, uh, about about his depiction in the film and all this sort of stuff. They got very they got very upset about it. There was there was proper pushback at the um, at the time because he'd yeah, been. Yeah, Daphne Maurier wrote wrote to was threatening to sue Levine and wow. all sorts of things that, came from it. That's right because he'd gone into the royal household, hadn't he? Um, uh, mm. After his military career ended, and then basically drank himself to death, Browning. But 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 but. He, you know, he's he's but he looks so cool. If you want your your absolutely mega sharp guardsman, if you want the virtues of, of the of the brigade of guards, um, there that there they are. I mean, how sharp is he throughout? And even you know, famously at the end, the the, the you know the, it, when Urquhart meets him after the battle, and he's really pissed off that Browning looks so immaculate, and he's you know he's basically been dragged across the Rhine in a rubber dinghy, yeah. and, and and has and has had the nine worst days of his life, blah blah blah, and the, and that Browning's so immaculate, and the and airborne myth is that that um, Urquhart struck Browning at that meeting, that he wow. punched him. Um, uh, what what one one because there's lots of myths swirling around, but one story is that that's what actually happened is that Ur- Urquhart. Um, Punched him and he said, "Well, you all did your best. I'm awfully sorry it didn't work out." And he lamped him, <laughs> supposedly. But 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 the point is, is um, Attenborough's really into the gear and the kit, and and yeah. and so as a what as a like sort of uh, um, the iconography of the war, f- as- that aspect of the war film is really like, wow. I mean, it's as beautiful as the Battle of Britain in terms in terms of how sexy the stuff looks, and in technical too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. those denizens look peak technical. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, you know. There we are. There's one on the back of my chair. Well, there we are. Well, audio <laughs> listeners, Al Murray is, is is resting himself on a Denison smock. Um, <laughs> there's some flexing going on here. Um, a little bit, a tiny bit. <laughs> well, uh, um, so just to go through little, some few production notes before we talk about cast and some of our favourite scenes. Yeah. So it was, at the time, the budget was $25 million, and I adjusted it for inflation. That's $73 million today. So Right. What a bargain. Yeah, double that for yeah. advertising. Probably about $150 million. It's quite cheap yeah. for today's standards, really. Yes. Um, so it was filmed in Holland, but Arnhem was replaced by a town called Deventer um, because Arnhem was a bit too modernised and built up. They couldn't film it at the actual bridge. 18-month um, production. Well, they did have to rebuild it. They didn't have to rebuild it, yeah. Yeah. 18-month production, 500 extras. Baptiste was the armoury. Um, and I've got a couple of contemporary reviews, and it's quite interesting. Reviews at the time weren't too sort of positive. So we've oh. got... Roger Ebert, that powerhouse of um, movie critique, and he says, A Bridge Too Far is such an exercise in wretched excess, such a mindless series of routine scenes, such a boringly violent indulgence in all the blood and guts and moans they could find, that by the end we're prepared to speculate that maybe Levine went two or even three bridges too far. (laughs) <laughs> Whoa! And the Daily Mirror, the week it was reviewed, um, the week it was released, sorry, in 1977, says uh, one or two false dramatic notes are struck because this is no straight documentary, but few national banners are waved, and I feel no stirring of patriotic fervor at the end. For this reason, I welcome *A Bridge Too Far* as a remarkably effective anti-war movie, but it will not please those who still polish their war medals. So there we go, chaps. There we go. <laughs> Wow. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, I'm not sure Ebert saw the same film we did, personally. I think he was a bit, <laughs> you know, 
I think I think he's missed some of the subtext there that we were talking about earlier. He might have had a few too many well, the, for the, the free bar well for the <laughs> for the mirror to see to, to to clock it, the mirror viewer to clock it, and him not is quite interesting, isn't it? Because mm-hmm. it because it is an anti it is an anti war film. It's just it does in the process make arguably make war look the most like the most spectacular, amazing thing you could possibly clap eyes on. But let's not you can't get hung up on that. Can <laughs> no. you? <laughs> so the cast, I mean, gosh, I mean, if there's someone famous in the late 70s i mean god they've got them and they're all um a surname film stars yes they are redford olivier hackman connery kane kane exactly you have to work your way a fair way down the list before you have to start using people's full names to tell you who's in this film yeah and you've got you know ed fox playing horrocks as well i mean fantastic yeah. he's the only actor in the whole thing that wins an award um he got a bafta best supporting actor for horrocks um and he's the only one that did wow Oh, wow. Only one BAFTAs, and he only won British awards. They were planning on it to do well overseas, but it, it kind of bombed it in the States. Did well in Europe, obviously. Now you think, well, God, this movie must have been an absolute smash, but it doesn't really, you know, and it's got fantastic people, you know, behind it. You're the the guy who did the cinematography, he worked with Kubrick. Wow. Yeah. Jeffrey Unsworth. So let me just give you a rundown of some of the films that he made before this, yeah. because it's phenomenal. So we've got The Planter's Wife in 52 with Jack Hawkins. That's a Malayan emergency film. How many of those are there? The Purple Plane with uh, Gregory Peck. Hell Drivers with Cy Enfield and Stan Baker. Whoa. Uh, a Night to Remember, Titanic with Kenneth Moore. The Northwest Frontier, which is a personal fave with Kenneth Moore. Yeah. Absolutely epic film. The 300 Spartans. Wow. Genghis Khan with Yul <laughs> Brynner. 2001 A Space Odyssey. Cromwell with Richard Harris. Blimey. And then, of course, uh, Zardoz with Sean Connery. Amazing. Incredible. So this man has, he won, he's won over his career, I think, two two Oscars and a, and a half a dozen BAFTAs. I think his cinematography is like the forgotten element that really sort of like makes this film mm. what it is. Yeah. Because you can see from the, the, those previous films that he's worked in epic He's worked in war film. Yeah, yeah. He knows how to to sort of frame things. Yeah, and get that action mm. to be kinetic within the scene. It's just when you look through his his credits, it's like wow. Okay, it's a testament to Attenborough and Levine for pulling in talent like that. Not only cast talent, but also production talent. That is a boggling CV, isn't it? Yeah, that's an incredible CV. So it just turns up and just goes. Yeah, I'll shoot your movie. And you go, oh, what have you done? <laughs> you go, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Here's a camera. Oh, you need 20 cameras on this airborne okay. sequence. No Fantastic. problem. Yeah. Can you make like five Shermans that went 40? Of course I can. Of course I can. Yeah. Another thing the film is sort of famed for is the incre- that incredible theme tune by John Addison. I mean, mm. come on. They know that. Yeah. You know you know when that bit, when the theme song kicks in, you've got about five minutes to make a cup of tea because they play the whole bloody thing. <laughs> <laughs> He was actually a member of 30 Core. He was in the 23rd Assault. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So he was there, which is, I think, amazing. Quick rundown of the plot. Um, I mean, if you haven't seen it, come on. It's British too far. I mean, who hasn't seen it? It is 1944. The war in Europe still rages. It starts like that, doesn't yeah. it? Um, Patton and Montgomery, Montgomery. Oh, God, do we have to talk about that? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, God, sorry. It, no, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Um, you're the guest. Um, so, yeah, and it's, you get this incredible little sequence of, of, of stock footage, um, which is really, really nice. Some of it's incredibly rare. Like Some of it you don't see no. today no, you don't. In, in documentaries and, or anything like that. You know, there's a pair of, like... Um, uh, universal carriers that shoot by fire and flamethrowers. Okay. Yes. There's some wonderful shots of convoys moving. There's beach shots of, of D-Day. It's, it's, it, there's some incredible footage in that like first five minutes. Do you think it's a little bit like a first of the few where like that, that uh, footage of the early Spitfire prototype is like survived by the film and no one's noticed? So like, you know, there's just some random wasp carriers and some guys somewhere it's like, I need that footage and it, it's in the start of a bridge too far and they've noticed. That would be hilarious. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So the plot basically is Operation Market Garden start to end. I mean, you, you can't really say anything more than that. That's what's interesting about it. Although, you know, it, when you get push into the history and a lot of it's sure. like wonky. Mm. I mean, wrong, wrong's a bit strong, but wonky or, 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 you know, lots of things are elided or compressed and all that sort of thing. But it is, it is essentially... Uh, we will. We've decided that the Germans are falling back, so we're going to try and bounce our way across the Rhine, and we're going to use airborne forces to do it. And the landing zones we picked um, uh, is a decision that may come back to bite us on the arse later. And the Americans at the 
bottom, the middle, and with the Brits at, at the top with the poles. And the poles are the, the guy in charge of the poles is a handful. The bloke running the whole thing is a bit of a prig. Um, there's an argument about intelligence about whether they should go or not. They go. Some of it works. Some of it doesn't work. High drama. Bloke gets stuck in loft when he shouldn't. When he should know better. Um, uh, some people make it to the bridge and by the led by their doughty commander uh, fight as best they can to the last round pretty much uh, then the rest hang on and the Americans cross the river in dinghies which is ludicrous and insanely brave and then everyone at the end goes oh dear sorry that didn't work out what a pity it's the most ama- it, uh, it, as, a, as a summary of the event the events it's it's not bad no. and that's the thing about it it's harder to fault it's harder to fault I think than the longest day we go oh, half the longest day oh for god's sake but 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 this is really, and it, you know, which of course comes from the same source, essentially from a Ryan book. Of course, um, uh, it's. Ba- I think it's bang on, really. Mm. And you get to perv on. They they did make a proper effort to make the gear about right. The certainly the sort of the stuff the paras have got and the airborne have got is pretty much about yeah. right. And they they made a real effort to do that. And and that's that's striking that you, that. Um, that, that they cared about that because you you know you, you if, if you've got movies at the time or that preceded like the Battle of the Bulge film where no one gives a flyer about whether it bears any resemblance to the events what the what the kit looks like you've got that weird, really weird thing where sometimes the Germans are speaking English and sometimes they're speaking German they speak English and they sing in German you're like oh ah whereas this like at least is trying to um trying to sort of wrestle all of, all of the elements into the, you know, yeah. squeeze it on yeah. and ship in a bottle style into the into the film. It's a war epic done properly. I yeah. mean, compared to Battle of the Bulge, um, which is a train wreck, literally. Oh, yeah. We did it twice, unfortunately. We, yeah, we have. We have done it twice at this point. <laughs> now. I'm sure... Well, I like I'm sure got the... a dog going back to its sick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's some good... <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to hate it love to hate it but um, but yeah I, I, you're exactly right I think A Bridge Too Far is is the you know the pinnacle of of, of that genre yeah we won't see it's like again just because of the nature mm. of filmmaking because of the you know the nature of CGI we're, we're seeing mostly you know it, practical effects just aren't yeah. there anymore yeah. it's, it's you know it's CGI motion capture etc etc uh, taking the place of good old model work and uh, good set dressing and, you know, a good matte painting in the background. <laughs> There's not, not a lot of model work in this. Uh, uh, no. um, I mean, that, that's what's interesting about this. It's, it's all basically practical. It's all really, exactly. m- mainly really happening in front of the camera. In terms of films that attempt to tell the story as truthfully as possible, this is kind of like the Dam Busters in that respect. Mm-hmm. It's the, the, the Dam Busters is pretty similar in its a- a- ambition. It uses some animation, but but tells the story from start to finish. It's you know again it's wonky, and also at the end has that bit where he goes, oh, I've got to go write those letters. So in the end says, oh Christ, load of people been killed. What's it all? What, what's it all for? Which the Dan Buster sort of sneaks in at the very end. This this um kind of not anti-war sentiment, but like what what the hell is this all about sentiment? And it, and it's sort of like, but it's like because it's Attenborough, it's that, that on an epic scale on steroids. Yeah. Scenes of thousands. I mean, that's that's the other thing is that you know the battle scenes rival the Waterloo movie in that respect, and the sheer number yeah. of people. And the fact he's doing it in Western Europe, not Eastern Europe, yeah, 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 yeah speaks yeah. volumes of of the ability to wrangle all those men. Yeah, the, they only had one one uh, slot to try and get the the drop yeah. filmed. Yeah, you know, so they had the twenty cameras rolling. Yeah, so it's a phenomenal effort, and it took him two years, and he apparently went seven days a week, no breaks. For two years straight. Well, and it shows. That's the thing. I mean, we'll talk about the drop scene in a bit, but um, just that. You, no one would ever attempt that now. No. There aren't enough paratroopers yeah. anyway. Um, <laughs> there aren't enough D- Dakotas and, and, and so on. You know, you look at Band of Brothers where they, where they have similar scenarios and that's all... I mean, it's very well done, but it, you do not get the feeling that it's happening in front of your eyes in the way that you do with nice. this. You know, you know, it's happening inside a inside a hard drive somewhere on a server, whirring away like <laughs> on, like that. I, mean, I think it, it, I always say, you know, it, it ends up looking like a PlayStation Two cutscene rather than a real thing. You know, at least in this yeah. movie, yeah, you can can smell the blanco on, on the webbing. Yeah. You know, I think that's it's what yeah. makes it what makes it makes it. So 
I think we'll, we'll, we'll go into the alley tally because there's just so much stuff to yeah. talk about this week. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll run the jingle and we'll come back. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. So, uh, Al, as the guest this week, regale us with your Ali Tally picks. For me, it's the it's the rubber Shermans or fiberglass Shermans that uh, feature in the in the thirty core build up scenes and then in the thirty core battle scenes and and you know. I mean, the, the advantage for the filmmaker, of course, is that it's a single road on a dike, so you have to have things in silhouette. So t- tanks don't tanks don't go hull down. So you can make f- four or five Shermans going along the going along a skyline look epic. But of course, they're not Shermans; they're Land Rovers with you know single sided fiberglass uh, things attached to them. And every now and again, you get a, you can see the Land Rover wheels. That, that, that you know, because they do that thing of having the hero. Um, uh, item at the front so the pra- the actual real tanks at the front and then the stuff at the back that's masquerading you know like in lord of the rings if you look at the, the crowd scenes the the, or- the the orcs deteriorating costume quality, quality the further from camera they are right and it's uh it's or the and the elves it's, so it's the same it's the same thing and i think the sort of ingenuity of uh, of coming up with a thing that looks like an armored column you know, because it's the seventies, and everyone scrapped their Shermans or sold them to his, the Israelis, mm. and you know they're 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 in the Negev desert or something, having been blown up or whatever. You know, like, you know what yeah. I mean. Or, or and and just the fact that they bother with the hardware that they don't use Pershings, that they don't use the stuff that was obviously still kicking around at that point, mm-hmm. and and also. I just, you know, that the, the, to, to see what are meant to be fireflies on screen is a yeah. really cool thing because because. That's someone who knows that there were fireflies. That's someone who knows that this stuff and this stuff, if you're going to represent it, you've got to make it look right. And they and they bothered. And I think that, you know, that their approach is alley yeah. to, to, to the to the alley kit. They're being cool about the cool kit. They get it. And um, that scene where, they, where, where you know, Vandler is driving along, oh, chaps and all that. Right. Um, that, that is absolutely brilliant because you really, really get the sense of the of the armored column, in the same way you get the sense of a parachute brigade landing, you know, parachuting. You, you, it, it delivers the same vibe, you know. I've got a copy of After the Battle, a Battle of Arnhem special, and there's a little write up in it. So it was compiled by Charlie Mann, the Military Vehicle Museum yep. in Cornwall. Yeah, and there was eight M4 Sherman tanks, an M4 Sherman dozer, five replica Sherman tanks, and several tank holds from X ranges. Wow, that Vandalur scene where he's driving up with Horrocks, he must have like. It feels fluid, but they must have shot it like six different times, moving those tanks. Well, all around. gone round in a circle. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. the, 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 he's basically going round a circuit, isn't he? And just going past people, and and once he's gone past them, they redress, um, swap the blokes around, and maybe swap some of the vehicles around. I mean, it is it it it, it, it is really extraordinary because because you didn't have, they didn't have to do that, but they obviously felt that they had to do that. You know, well. Battle of the Bulge proved they didn't have to do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but they should do that. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. I think it's one of the things that holds up because we know now you can go away, you can research all this kit in five minutes. But back then, you yep. probably couldn't do it as easily. No, you so, couldn't. You know, now, now we're watching, oh, look, carriers. Oh, look, it, uh, you know, half tracks. Oh, look, a Humber armoured car. When the hell do you ever see a Humber armoured car these days? Bloody hell, it's a Bedford. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm up, yeah. I'll talk about Bedfords in a minute. Um, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just so <laughs> impressive, you know, to now. You know you know all that kit's genuine. You, you know it's all genuine stuff where it's, it's not been CGI'd in, as we said. You know, now you could do that column yeah. in five minutes. Yeah. There's a lovely mix of of cast and welded hull mm. Shermans. Yes. So you've got the M4s and you've got the, and the cast hulls. Yeah. Uh, and and the welded holes, uh, sorry. So that's you know that alone. You're like, oh look, yeah, cast holes and welded holes in the same scene. Yeah, to the people who care, it conveys the fact that everything was a was a bit of a mishmash. That you had the mm. you used the gear you had. You know the what the the, the standardisation only went so mm. far, um, uh, especially by this stage of the war. After all, where they where they are, of course, right at the end of their logistic train, and and you know some of the units have got their ass hanging out by this point the whole treatment of the of of the um you know the battle side of it um i think is it's brilliant i mean my other ali ali thing would be the horsa you know they build up they built horsa gliders and apparently during the during that scene it did take off you know the replica horsa took off 
Um, and and they, oh, suddenly, you know, oh shit, we need to get it to land again. But but the fact that they didn't cut corners with that scene alone, and the thing, just the thing of the rope unwinding and the representation of the of of you know of an air landing brigade going into action, absolutely amazing. You know, because because after all, you know, theirs is the glory, is the oh. uh, as the advantage of being able to use the footage. <laughs> yeah. And and you know, it wasn't at the you know. Nowadays, we're used to watching footage dropped in and things change colour and and different gradings and and people play these sort of mul- you know multimedia if you want um, uh, uh, tricks uh, to, to let us know what's happening and to maybe drop us into the fact that you're watching a historical event by showing us some old footage is what they sometimes do now. But that wasn't a convention in the mid seventies. You didn't no. do that. You know, they they a little bit at the front to remind you you're watching a thing about thirty years ago. After all, which is the other thing about this film is it's you know a much fresher yeah. event and 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 yet you know so they can't do that but the, those glider scenes with the with the, the whole thing it's it's just brilliantly done those scenes with the horses it does mirror that stock footage it, it is almost shot for yeah. shot you know I'm, I'm i'm half expecting to see uh stanley max dead just milling around yeah. with with Urka and all that getting some getting some vox pops yeah. for the time you know it's sort of yeah it doesn't happen, unfortunately. But I always think, okay, so now I know what's coming up next because it's it's that stock footage. Oh no, it's not. Hang on, it's yeah, it's, they replicated it. And they were absolutely right to mirror the stock footage because I mean, the thing is, those people filmed exactly what they needed. To, of course, and were brilliant at framing stuff and brilliant mm-hmm. at uh, telling a story with the tiny amount of um, uh, film they had at, at, at their disposal. So I mean, you know, you're, you're stealing from the best if you're stealing from uh, from that footage. Yeah talking about shot for shot likeness in there's is the glory they use a piece of army film photographic unit footage where it's actually filmed by someone who is on a parachute yeah you see them jump out of the plane mm. descend and they they replicate that in i think it's sasabowski's drop yes they do um i, th- I think they might do it twice i think they do it twice it's certainly in the mm. the, op- the the opening drop there's a bloke you know it's all wow yeah bro. they they read they basically it's it's exactly yeah. the same shot and it's just that's just something that jumped really, out yeah. me last time I watched it. it was like, oh, camera yeah. in the kit bag, isn't it? Yeah. Basically, that straps mm. his leg. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Matt, Ali Pick. Quite possibly my favourite thing is seeing so many Stem Mark Fives just hanging around. Like it's just an amazing num- amount of of Mark Fives. The Rolls Royce of Sten guns. Yes. And you know, this is the first uh, the first major use of the Mark Five. Obviously, it was um, used during D Day, but and at this point, everyone had been re- you know re equipped with Mark Fives. And so we get copious amounts of, of Sten action, um, some really brilliant sort of like hero scenes where, you know, the chaps are running towards pillboxes mm. and um, there's that great scene when Sean Connery is rescued from Arnhem by a, a group of chaps and they, they attack a, a leopard, I mean a panther. And yeah. um, <laughs> what's that? Sorry. No, you know what? I thought that too. It does because you know why, you know why it looks like a Mark II is because the guy's holding it weird. Right, it has a wooden stock and a pistol grip. It doesn't have the front um, pistol grip because they took, they, a lot of lads took that off though because it used to break. Yeah, well, do you know do you know why they stopped putting yeah. that on there? Fun fact, um, because it, it twerked the barrel nut that held the um, the barrel in place. Ah. So they decided that we should probably not have that as a as a as a feature anymore. But anyway, but he is actually <laughs> armed with the Mark V. Um, because he's holding it round the wrist of the stock right. and his fingers sort of like curl forward. So it looks like he, he's holding it as you would a Mark II or a Mark III. Maybe that's his characterization. He's been in so long, he just knows how to handle a Mark II. Doesn't like the newfangled Mark V, yeah. Pistol grip? What the hell is this? Well, I cut a Liam for <laughs> off and stuck it in his den. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of them. Um, the other that stands out to me, it kind of melds into one of my favourite scenes, is... Um, where Connery is Urquhart. Is it Lathbury that's been wounded or someone who's supposed to be sort of Lathbury? Um, as they're trying to move through the suburbs of Arnhem, they've got him on a Dutch civilian's you know, dining mm-hmm. room table uh, and they're talking about, well, can we get him Can we get him out of here? Can we get him to a hospital? What can we do? And then this German just idly walks by, you know, spit takes, turns back round. He's like, that's Sean Connery. And, <laughs> <laughs> and quick as a flash. Sean Connery basically emptied an entire magazine from his um, Colt 1911 into this German through a window. And then we get this beautiful shot of um, the, the Dutch civilians just aghast that 
Sean Connery's put six lovely little holes through, you know, their dining room window and, and shot a German. Um, and they're like, just go, go, and stop shooting Germans through our window. <laughs> Glass isn't exactly easy to come by in 1944 Holland. I love that, you know, that hero feature of, a, of a 1911 in airborne use, because obviously it was later, you know, replaced by the Brownie High Power, um, famously. Um, but, you know, it's just nice to, to have that, little yeah. feature but there's so much in this film like that's two tiny microcosms and i'm not even i haven't even mentioned the pia yet i mean save that for faith scenes i think yeah yeah yeah, yeah. obviously, obviously. <laughs> the, um, i like the inclusion of lot number fours as well because that's a you know that's a big myth that mm. all the parents had stents you know majority had Lee enfields airborne yeah. forces basically had um probably double or more the allotment of stents right. per infantry section so standard was one by the end of the war, you've seen probably two per section. Mm. Whereas like with the Paris thing, it's like three or four. But the air landing guys tended to be riflemen rather than uh, carrying stents, didn't they? Because the, the mm. uh, and, and also had um, uh, larger, the, the companies were larger and the battalions were larger. Didn't they? they had four companies, they had four companies to battalion and all that sort of thing. So they were, they were more heavily tooled up, which is why it's a sort of essential mystery that they send the light guys into town to do the important bit, mm-hmm. but um, we, let's not get let's not got, but get bogged down in Market Garden again. <laughs> uh, again, <laughs> itself. Brens too. Yeah, shout out for the Brens. Brens yeah. were a blank Good. adapter in one scene. Is there? When um, they're waiting for the um, you know that initial armored column that comes up, there's mm-hmm. a lad sort of waiting. Yeah, and he's like he's just look, he's just arranging his mags on his sand like sandbag like emplacement. There's a blank adapter on his Bren. So I think that's an absolute inclusion. My alley this week is just wall-to-wall Bedfords again. <laughs> Eagerly listeners will remember a few weeks ago we we did The Way Ahead and there was an obscene amount of Bedfords in it. And I thought we'd never see the like of that again in a film. But no, lo and behold, there's, uh, there's is the glory, cracky. There's is the glory too, Electric Boogaloo, maybe we can call it. <laughs> <laughs> it has more Bedfords in it. So we got two Bedford QLs, a Bedford QL Trooper, a Bedford QL Expendable. Sacrilege. I know. And that Bedford actually buys it at two hours, six minutes in. He gets blown up, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. Carrying the boats, no less. Yeah. Poor little, poor Bedford. Apparently there's a well bike as well. I didn't see it. Oh, wow. I've no. never seen the well bike. That's no, amazing. I've not spotted the well bike. like Perhaps saunters it's... past it the, you know, in the background. Maybe. Mm, maybe. And then obviously I like the... You know, Sean Connery in his Windac, looking awesome. You know, the amount of Denisons that there are, you know, there, there are definitely some post-war variants in there. There's some that aren't even Denisons, let's, you know, let's face it. When you've got 500 fellas as extras, there's going to be some modern smock slipping through, which is, you know, completely forgivable. My last one is, is it's a not really alley, but it's weird for me to see as a, as a moviegoer. Anthony Hopkins with a full head of hair. That has just always creeped me out. <laughs> just looks odd but anyway <laughs> i've got one more deck bogard's boy browning um, custom little uh, tunic that he has oh yes which you see for one scene which is sort of like a general briefing mm-hmm. scene with all of the uh, the yeah. airborne obviously he's got ryan o'neill in there and i think uh sasabowski yeah. and uh, hackman is in there and that and he has that lovely cut which kind of replicates browning because browning was a very suave chap um and he had he had that um, completely non-service jacket that he designed himself. So that is the pinnacle, the true definition of Ali. You know, it's something that isn't service and it's cool and it sets you apart. Horrocks' roll neck as well. Horrocks' yeah. roll neck that like is below his um, his battle dress tunic. That's you know that's that's a look. <laughs> Fave scenes chapter I think that brings us on to. Al, as guest, you've got to go first. Well, for me, it's the the parachute drop that the, the, at the start of the operation, where that where you have Dakotas as far as the eye can see. I think it's one para, um, uh, the men of one para dropping. Apparently, it was included as one of their twelve drops a year to stay qualified, right? So the, <laughs> so, the so the you know the army the army never never missing a trick to sort of cut corners. Mm. 
Um, it was it was regarded as an exercise. But but what's so good about it? I mean, the, the, the parachutes are slightly wrong because they've got the frills on them. They're the they're the um, mm. PX one marks four mark, mark PX one mark four, right. I think, with the frill, which is a fifties innovation to stop the to stop that sort of jellyfish oscillation you can get when a shoot um, uh, comes down wrong. Right. But other than that, it's like being there. And I, I did a, I, I've done this. I've, I did for a road to Berlin, which we made in 2004. I jumped yeah. onto the Ginkelheider from a, from a Dakota. And there is watching that. It's this, it's like being in the bloody airplane again, which is not, you know, not a nice thing. Right. And that you feel the, you feel the energy and the adrenaline of the moment straight off the screen, the urgency of going out the door, the whole thing is completely conveyed on screen. It's extraordinary. And, just, you know, scale aside, um, you know, because because we've talked, we've talked a lot about how epic this film, the, 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 the simple personal thing of going out the door of an mm. aeroplane, which is a preposterous thing to do, let alone as a way of delivering someone into battle, you know, look, of all the hairbrained fucking things in the world but 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 um but it really conveys that and that's the strange thing you know and, and before i jumped i'd sort of thought oh well, you know what this is an extraordinary epic scene but having done it and having done it at the ginkle hider as well you know that's what it looks like when you're coming down that the 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 the, 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 the that's what the heath yeah. looks like that's what it's like the noise of being in the aircraft and that's the like you said earlier on the bit where the, the camera sh- footage where they've got the camera on the guy that's what it's like that's what it's like, and you're in air. For, you're in the air for no time at all. You know, we 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 jumped at I think a thousand feet, and so we were in the air for maybe fifty seconds. And the first four or five are are concerned with making sure the shoots deployed, the canopies deployed properly. So you're doing your counting, you're counting you down, and because the Dakota goes so slowly, just sort of ninety knots when you jump out. Um, you you have to count for longer. You have to count for four seconds before you then check whether your lines are tangled and. And do your kick out drills and all that sort of thing. So, so um, you know, it, it all happens. It all happens incredibly quickly, and the, it, that scene totally conveys it. And then, and then, and then, on top of that, you know, we were doing it. And it was all, all sort of jolly and commemorative, and there were jump marshals on the ground. The sheer chaos of people landing around you and the stuff happening around you. That aspect of it too. That 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 I think again is in the is in the original footage from the from the battle. Yeah, they completely yeah. capture it, and uh, and um, mm. and uh, you know, we, you just know CGI that would not work. Right. It would not. It would not. It would not have the you were there aspect of it. And the other thing is, is that j- the actual jeopardy of it, because you're shooting a thing where someone might break their neck, and they might break their neck as a matter of course, because it's a kind of one in a thousand with that round shoot. Um, accidents, you know, or failures. So, and the only difference is that they're jumping with reserves, which after all the guys, the guys in the 1940s didn't jump with a reserve parachute. And that's the, no. that's the difference. And other than that, it's complete. And most of them, I think most of them are jumping clean fatigue, not too many of them jumping with, um, with uh, a, a kit bag. Yeah. Because, you know, yeah, no leg bags, though, the leg so. bags, there's some, there's not many, there's some, because it's too dangerous and there's no point and, and all that. But, Tons of blokes going out the doors of Dakotas. There it is. That's exactly, they completely nail it. And that, you know, that alone, I mean, there are dramatic scenes in the film and there are touching scenes and there are sort of revealing scenes and all, you know, you, you've got everything else. But that for sheer like kinetic filmmaking, for action filmmaking, is peerless, I think. I really do. I mean, I think that no one's got close. Yeah, if you don't get that right, you, you know, it, it's the whole film, isn't it, really? Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it also yeah. does its best to show how the scale of the drop us as civilians watching it it, it really yeah. captures the jesus how many planes are there you know and you, yeah you get that nice shot of everyone looking up and seeing the the sky train yeah. it yeah it, it really it, it really captures that 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 sort of and that's one thing that unfortunately like this is the glory doesn't do i think this does, doesn't, yeah. doesn't have the budget at all but it's it's such a awesome scene in, in the actual way that word should be used it's awesome yeah, and the and the bit where it's is it Modal or Student? I can't remember who they have in the film because they because they play fast and loose with the yeah. generals are actually are and what they say. It says you know if only I had these means at my disposal. You see what he you see what he mm, means. Of course. Um. Uh. 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 uh you know they, they they show and tell you that. Um. It, 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 in in that sort of sequence of the air armada mm. going over, 
Um, and um, and also it makes you think, thank God he didn't. No, yeah, Christ. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even though it all goes wrong, you know, thank God he didn't. Yeah, it's a spectacular scene, uh, just the, the scale of it. And as you said before, it's that tension that ramps as it would have done on the day, you know, where all the Dakotas start moving off and the slack picks up on the glider lines. And, you know, it, you see there's that quick shot of like the whole field of all the engines revving yeah. and the little, little backdrop of even more Dakotas in the background. And, you know, they slowly move off. And, and then finally we get that payoff of all that tension of, you know, they're out the door. And then from, you know, from then on, it's out of, out of their hands, it's out of your hands. You just got this spectacular mm. sequence of the men falling and, and like landing in the drop zones. And then that rush and that energy of, of them grabbing their kits and, you know, checking weapons and um, pulling Jeeps out of horses and God knows what else. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's a phenomenal scene. And as, as you said, it does capture some of those um, army film and photographic unit um, shots from, you know, Varsity and, and Market yeah. Garden. Um, so you can see, you can tell that, that someone's looked at those, looked at photographs, looked at film and gone, okay, so we need to do this and you need to look like this and these need to be here. Well, the, I mean, the, you know. the other thing that I think, you know, uh, uh, this, this will sound tangential, but it isn't when, um, uh, when, uh, Neil Innes and Eric Idle made the Ruttles film, um, they, they sat George Harrison down to watch it. Right. And, uh, and he said, well, this is great, but um, uh, what's that meant? Which bit's that meant to be? Because he hadn't seen the Beatles footage that they had been that they had gone and watched compulsively wow. in order to lampoon it. Right? It wasn't all on YouTube. It wasn't at people's disposal. You had to go look for it. And and this is the same. We are so familiar now with with you know all the imagery because after all, all the all the imagery in any book you've ever looked at is a still from this stuff anyway, that absolutely, you know, anyone getting out of a glider, anyone marching into on them, all of it is stills. We're familiar with it all now. And the fact is they weren't, you know, so they, they were drawing on a thing that people hadn't necessarily yeah. seen or hadn't seen since theirs is the glory. Maybe that, 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 that they didn't, you know, they didn't have on a, on their, they didn't have on a VHS. They didn't have on a DVD. They didn't have on YouTube. I think as well, that, that makes sense because all, I was looking at my, my book, my shelf of books and I was looking at all my power related ones. They're all like, yeah. 78, 79. Yeah. They're all like post this film. So right. I think maybe, you know, this obviously film grabs a, the, the cultural a new, like brain and, and it says, right, and we're, now we're going to make the, the books. Now, now you can search it yeah. properly. Now we're going to do the, the, the actual writing of, of, of it. And with that, however, then distorts the story of the battle. And um, when we were filming there, I remember we were filming there in 2004. Um, <laughs> this is awful. It's, we were, I was having a very long, and we were there for the, commemorations so you know the so the the, the uh, 60th you know so there was still plenty of old old guys about and they on the friday night they showed the film on the on the bridge on a big screen wow uh, uh yeah i know so you know there's the cake to horse um narration at the start ringing out across the town Beautiful. um uh, yeah it's extraordinary and we're we're down at the bottom of the uh, uh by the river on the embankment of the river down at the bottom on the on the western side of the bridge and I'm, I was arguing with, our, with, with, with the series producer who'd come over because everyone wanted to hobnob at Arnhem. Also, because I was going to jump out of an airplane. They all wanted to make sure I didn't kill myself, <laughs> right? So all the people responsible for the program are in town. And um, we're having a, I'm going, look, we've left the battle in the woods out of this. We've left what happened to 4th, 4th Parachute Brigade out of this story, right? It's not in the film. Well, you know, we, we've only got so much time and we can't convey everything. And it's a complex battle and we want the viewers to be able to keep up. So you're actually saying you don't think our viewers can handle it. That, that there's another element to this story. Well, it's not that Al, but you know, blah, 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 blah. And we're having a long argument about it. Sat on the Jeep we tooled around mm -hmm. Europe in. And this old boy on sticks comes over and goes, uh, I the, you're the fucking BBC like that. Is it Northern Irish guy? Yeah, the, oh, the bloody BBC. Typical. Here you are with the glory boys at the bridge while me and my mates were getting cut to pieces in the woods. And he's like, well, I said to my producer, there you go. See? <laughs> <laughs> and I'd said to him, you know, in the argument, I go, what if I'm sat in a pub and some bloke comes over and goes, you did a thing about Arnhem and you left my grandpa yeah. out. <laughs> he was in the woods and this bloke, you know, and that happened in real, in real time. Then, and then that's one of the, one of the problems with the film is that the, the, that whole bit is that, gone. Yeah. That's one of my big issues with it is you don't, you don't see Lonsdale at all. No Lonsdale force. Shrinking no. perimeter gets mentioned once or twice. The, the only bit you see of yeah. the a fight around the Harshstein Hotel is, is some lads in the, in the background of a scene with Sean Connery just walk over to a wall and prop their Lee Enfields up 
and just wait for yeah. cut to be called. It's sort of it's such a shame. Yeah. I think, and obviously you can't understand it's budgetary, it's time, it's all that. But cut some of the janky American scenes and stick in some perimeter. You know. Well, well, exactly, because that is you know because there are two last stands after all. Um, uh, uh, um, in Arnhem, and the bat and the battle in the woods is a is a. Well, just it's such an extraordinary story, you know, that, that, that Hackett's brigade goes from being fully established to basically 150 blokes in 36 hours. Yeah. And 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 he set that brigade up and it disappears in front of him. You know, it, 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 I mean, it's the most extraordinary drama that. And they do have the scene, which is clearly Hicks and Hackett and everyone arguing about seniority when um, Urquhart disappears. That's in there. Um, mm. But then but then we forget about yeah, that. Don't worry about that. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing that theirs is the glory does well. I yeah. think it, it does show that woodland, you know, the the fighting in the woods, um, you know, and obviously the the there used to be perimeter, you know, it's got the um, the surviving German armors rolling around, you know, uh, and there's a couple of guys in in slit trenches, uh, yeah, trying to avoid it. It's just it's that's one of the strengths of that film. It just it does try and tell that story. But then it's not it's not trying to squeeze in 101st Airborne, 82nd Airborne, um. You know, Irish guards. It's it's you know, brigade of guards. It's not it's not trying to bother doing that. So that's that's why it's got the room for manoeuvre. So uh, Matt, favorite scene? Wow, um, there's so much to choose from. Um, I think my favorite scene. One of them is obviously um, Bond lost in Arnhem, um, where Connery is where uh, gets um, sort of cut off from his from his men and is stuck in a loft for, for a good half hour. Um, which I, you know, mentioned mm. in the alley tally, um, but one of my others is the river crossing scene, where the the Americans oh, yeah. are crossing to capture the bridge, and we have that great line from um, from Gavin, played by Ryan uh, O'Neill, and, and he says, "What's the best way to take a bridge from both sides? Both both ends at once." That's it. Yeah, is, is what Redford replies as uh, Major Julian Cook, and it's just such a good line, and the the, the scenes with those two. It can't they bounce off one another you know yeah. they f- it feels like there's a prior relationship yeah. you know it's it's um, um you know divisional commander talking to one of his you know battalion commanders there's that you know sort of relationship vibe to them and and redford's so believable in that role that you know they literally just throw his character yeah. in he just appears yeah. there's no setup to him it's just like it's just um o'neill as gavin walking through some tents going where's where's julian, where's julian? Where yeah, yeah 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 yeah, and he just pops up and goes here. Um, just the camera still like sweeps around, and it's like he's just by a tree, looking nonchalant. And it's, it's such a cool sort of like portrayal. Stick with him, don't you? Right until the end of his action. So it is nice. I like that. It, it's like yeah, it's just what that one flowing yeah. scene. So we get a few cuts back to the headquarters where they're saying, "Oh well, we you know we're waiting for the boats. Um, the the fouled up and the the." the the eight hours getting put back and back and back. So, you know, it's going to be the, the, the previous night. Now it's noon. Um, and then finally they get, they, you know, they set off, the smoke goes over, uh, guards armored, lay down some, some smoke and, you know, two companies of men in these tiny flimsy, uh, general service destroyer boats, <laughs> basically just sort of row like hell across the Rhine, not the Rhine. Sorry. Is it the Nader Rhine? Anyways, one of that's 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 my uh, Dutch Dutch geography knowledge not coming into. I'm not. It's the Mars, isn't it? Rivers. Is it? The, yeah, I think. It, yeah, I think it might be. Anyway, so they cross yeah. the river. This is the problem. Aren't there so many rivers in Holland? Let's yeah. not get hung up on that. That's that's. <laughs> I think that's the, that's the problem with um, uh, the Nader. The Nader Rhine's at Arnhem. It's the Arnhem River. That's right. It is. Yeah. That's great. So they they cross the river and then we get this beautiful sort of like set piece of um, them fighting up around the back of the bridge and you know yeah. up the bank and uh redford's running around with an m1 garand it's such a well shot scene you know it, the framing of it is beautiful we get those wide shots of the boats mm-hmm. going across uh the smoke the the mortars landing in the water the men you know being turfed out of boats frantically rowing that with their rifle butts um we get redford's line uh, you know Hail Mary, Mother of Grace. You know, he's saying his Hail, Mar- Hail Marys as he's crossing. Yeah. Uh, and that ramps the tension. And then, you know, they finally get up on the, on, on that bank and um, they they sweep through the German resistance. And there's a guy with a, 
with a uh, one thing I did notice is there's a guy with a, an original BAR that's like sat next to um, to Redford at one point, and it, you know it's not it's not the the World War Two era M1918 A2. It's an original World War One um, BAR, and you can tell it by the um, there's no bipod cross hatching, and there's uh, the cross hatching exactly. Yeah. Robbie knows because <laughs> um, I think I've mentioned it in like three different things now. With that's that's an original BAR that is. But yeah, so that's one of the little things that jumped out at me, and and you know, and then that beautiful Sherman comes across the bridge, machine gunning German snipers from the rafters. Yeah, just a great scene, just a really nicely shot scene. I'm going to pull rank here, chaps, because I, I fear that we have Al Murray here and we have Matthew Moss, who wrote a book on the bloody pier, and we're almost not going to bloody mention the thing. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, obviously the the scene is bring up the pier, though, <laughs> isn't it? Let's be honest now. Um, you know. If we had to trade the seconds of that for the battle in the woods, then it wouldn't be a fair trade. It's all about, you know, it's, it's, it's that scene. I mean, I, I do like the way it's sort of mutating into an internet meme as well. The idea that, that you know, that, it's, it's passing into the, the membrane of popular culture, historical popular culture. Yeah. yeah. Cause it, for those who know what a peat is, it's either well. There's the, there's the for those who know what a peat is, and there's the people who think they know what a peat is. The people who think they know what a peat is, oh, they're going to bring the rubber band out now and try and stop the <laughs> try and stop the uh, uh, tiger tank, yeah. right? Yeah. And of course, for those for those in the know, well, you know, not a bad bit of kit, perfectly effective if it's used properly by the people who know what they're doing and. You've got to be quite brave. I mean, the other thing is that Very. let's not forget there's six pounders in uh, 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 pits on the bottom of the, the bottom of the causeway anyway, and all that sort of thing, which we don't see, which we don't see firing a sabo round and all that sort of thing. So that so they're 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 pretty well set to deal with um, stuff if it gets close enough. But but anyway, it's just the way it conveys. You know, uh, Frost's in charge. Frost taking it all very seriously. He's cool in the situation. You know, we've seen him get his golf clubs ready. You know, do we, do, do, shall I bring the golf club, sir? Back in his dinner jacket. Exactly. Yeah. We've seen all that. You know, which suggests <laughs> is, is it how seriously are they all taking it? And this is him. So this is him taking it very, very seriously. And I think it. There's just something about it. And then, of course, the the poor dear Piet doesn't do the business, and that uh, and you know that they know they're in. They know they're really in trouble after that. And it's just because because uh, you know, all right, it's got the Piet, and we all we all love the. We love it as a bit of gear and the history around it and the stuff around it. But it also does the story very well of what the, the, the situation they find themselves in. Yeah, it becomes a totem to that scene on the bridge yeah. where, you know, it's it's the it's presented as the, you know, the last resort, the last line of defense. Yeah. And, and once that Panther with inverted quotes uh, goes by, then you know that things are bad because, you know, they can't hold off the enemy anymore. They're going to be enveloped. Um but it's such an iconic scene, oh. and when you know, just the way he shouts at you, yeah. it's like, oh, what other film brings up the pier in a more spectacular manner? No, true. There's only Dixon in, you know, there's yeah. the glory that yeah. just saunters out the door after doing a bit of cooking, <laughs> not <knocked out. laughs> <laughs> you know. So we we were doing some digging. So Matt, would you like to regale yeah. us with what we found about the pier in there? Yeah, Robbie found an absolute cracker in his book. Um, he found out that the chap on the pit was a chap called um, Bill. Islemore, who was a uh, former sergeant in the book says X 50th regiment, but since 1881, we, the British army hasn't used numbers no. as a regimental discord, no. but the 50th should be something like, um, I think it's the Queen's own Royal West Kent. Right. Yeah. If it takes it straight from that, maybe they just went, yeah, I'm from the 50th or they called themselves the 50th still. I don't know he talks about being the armorer on the film. So he must've been with Baptiste and, you know, it talks about them handing out 50, you know, 500 weapons being the normal sort of like handout for a scene. So can, can you imagine handing out that many? Bloody hell. Um, but it, but yeah, Robbie, do you want to, do you want to read the yeah, little go on, bit go on, on, sure. on that that you this found? This is thrilling. Sure. Uh, Sergeant Bill Aymore also excelled himself during the filming of the battle on the bridge by being an ace shot with the Piat. During all various takes, he was able to put the bomb exactly where the director wanted it and where it coincided with the special effects of the explosion. And he bloody does. Yeah. And he, every, you know, on both of those shots, it lands exactly where mm. the pyro goes yeah. off. And anyone tell me the pier is inaccurate. Watch that <laughs> scene. It, <laughs> it's missing, but it's missing on purpose. It's a bit earlier on where, where Frost and the boys are repelling that initial armoured attack across the bridge. 
and the peats the peats used there mm. um and it, and there's real good shots. yeah the, the bring up the peat scene isn't no. even the best peat scene is it Robbie? i yeah. feel that the, the peat is done a bit dirty because you see lads loading them and one lad gets his number two killed so he's on his own and then you see yeah. him again loading it on his own which is nice little touch um and then they knock out about three or four armored cars with with their peats and those yeah. scenes yeah. blinking you'll miss it sort of stuff and then later on when frost is like bring up the pit i'm like well you've already got them like you're like presenting it as this sort of it's like it's like our sort of 25 pounds <laughs> that we're bringing up but no it's, it's just a squad anti-tank weapon like you don't have to bring it up that is something i have wondered watching that surely the pit it's in a position somewhere and yeah you know, yeah. Um, although, although you know, you, you do read accounts where they they're keeping it somewhere safe, True. um, so that if if a tank rocks up and, and knocks the side of the house off, you haven't lost your mm. peer in the first yeah, um encounter. Um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, it, 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 but but yeah, just that whole sequence though, where where the where the house gets smashed to pieces and um and they really know they're so they good. really know they're in trouble. Yeah. It's so good and it's so, mm. you know. It, the house did overlook the bridge that the, the, those buildings were like that. And again, it's that sort of um, effort to really actually try and capture the, 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 the events is really, it's it really laudable, detail, I think. And before, yeah. yeah, I will say though, chaps, I will say that they could have had the pit hit the tank and it not knock it out. Yeah. yeah. Cause that was, that was very common. Like it would take maybe two or three rounds yeah. to knock out, knock out a tank, especially a Panther. Yeah. Um, so if you're hitting it full frontal, it's not. It's probably not going to quite do the job. It'll hit it. It'll detonate. Um, it would have been a Mark IV, though, wouldn't it? I mean, the the, the yeah. tigers don't turn up until a lot later in the battle when they're bringing them in on the trains. And I think they the tigers arrive on the Wednesday morning, don't they? When basically when uh, uh, the guys on the bridge are toast. It didn't. It didn't need to be a big bad panther. I suppose it did for because it's a leopard. They couldn't really make it like a Mark IV or a tiger. True. Because you'd have to have those sort of slanted sides of the of the panther to make yeah. it look, yeah. Because it'd be very difficult to, be. to dress up a a leopard one. But let let's just break down some of the other great yeah. theater scenes that are included that no one ever mentions. So <laughs> the guards arm would move off, and we have that brilliant set piece scene. The Shems are getting pasted oh, by yeah. the packs from the woods. And this should have just been what I talked about for the <laughs> Alan Talley experience. But we see all sorts in that one scene. We get. We get number fours, we get Bren guns, we get two Vickers, we get a vehicle mounted 50 caliber. But we also see at least two Piat teams get absolutely blown away mm. by enemy fire because they're bringing, they're, they're br literally bringing it up. Um, and there's, you know, the explosions and you see both of them, both of the Piat teams mm. sort of be killed. Yeah. Um, so that's the first time in the film that you see the Piat and it's split second. And then, obviously, as we mentioned, we've got the scenes at the bridge where, um, you know, we see the chaps in windows behind sandbags yeah. and one, one chap's, like, slotting the, um, the the pier round down into the guide tabs. So when he aims downwards, the bomb doesn't slip out the tray, which is a nice touch. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the climactic pinnacle moment of the whole film. Yeah. You see, the thing is, is I've, you know, I've seen it often enough. I'm going to have to watch it again now, <laughs> you swine um, and before i move on to my bit i have to do it um matt's book is still available in good bookshop and it's a cracking read let me say that i learned a great deal how many did, how many did they make Ooh, on the spot there i believe it was just short of one hundred forty thousand. Yeah. yeah and lonsdale famously said if he had had more than it held on oh do you want the lonsdale quote i'll give you the lonsdale quote yeah yeah, yeah. so we can't, can't go with we kept going to christmas or what is it yeah, yeah. So uh, in in his after action report for for Lonsdale Force, um, he, he he wrote the pits proved of immense value. The tragedy of the operation was the shortage, and towards the end, the complete lack of them. Time without number. The cry was, "Give me pits, and I'll stay until Christmas." <laughs> what more of a ringing endorsement can you get than <laughs> Dicky Lonsdale you know, saying that they proved an immense value? If, if they'd have had Lonsdale in it, though, who would have played him? That's a good question. That's a good because question. they've got every other bloody actor in it. He's a tall chap, sl uh, slender build, quite a distinct face. Mm. Mm. See, I thought if you know, a young, a, it's, it's, he's too old by this point, but a young David Niven might have had a shot. Yeah. You know, but it's too, he's too yeah. old. That's yeah. half the issue. But it's too old, but yeah, it's too old by this point. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's like 
There's one for everyone to ponder. Let us know on the Twitter at Fighting on Film. Let us know. We want to know who we sh- should have been cast as Dickie Lonsdale. So my fa- well, I'll quickly go through my favourite bit, and it is just a horror. It's just Edward Fox. He's only in like three scenes, pretty much. Still, a show. I mean, he gets a battle yeah. for it. So, yeah, and his speech to the to the rest of his of his thirty core COs and in his little briefing room, and he comes up, and the first the first words he utters are. This is the tale you'll tell your grandchildren how, and how mightily bored they'll be. It's just beautiful. Yeah. And then um, yeah. he explains, he basically is general exposition at this point. He is sort of just being, this is how Market Garden works. <laughs> this is how what we're going to do. Thank God they had that giant yeah, map God. made. <laughs> yeah. And then he says quite at the end, he's explaining why they've got to do what they're doing. You know, he's saying, look, it's vital that we keep moving and we can't stop, all this sort of thing. And he says... I'd like to think of this as one of those American Western films, the paratroops lacking substantial equipment, always short of food. They are the besieged homesteaders. The Germans, well, naturally, they're the bad guys. And 30 Corps, we, my friends, are the cavalry on the way to the rescue. Come on. Guy, I got goosebumps. It's, it's the way, it's the way you tell it. Um, it, it, is, it is an extraordinary performance. And, and the thing about Horrocks, of course, is... He was he was still alive, wasn't he? Because they all get this this p- photos of all the set visits, yeah. you know, which is the amazing thing, you know, that that Urquhart, that Urquhart doesn't know who Sean Connery is, and his daughters the story, so the stories go, uh, his daughters have to persuade him that it's a good thing, and you know, and that he should go, and and Frost Frost giving his famous advice to Hopkins not to run, and uh, you know, but 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 I mean the thing about Horrocks is is. What what I love about Horrocks is you can watch those programs he made in the fifties, yeah, mm. and and you go, yeah, he, Fox nailed him. He completely nailed him. Well, apparently they were friends, right? Well, Actually, there we are. Apparently they were friends, and he and Fox was adamant that he was going to get him right, and you know, and Fox is just powerhouse anyway in that, yeah. in that scene. He just plays it so well. Exactly. I mean, and the and the the other bit for me is when um, Kane and, and Fox are driving up. To their full mate to start their starting point, and you just see all the all the kids yeah. talk about it before, but all the kit in the background is beautiful. And there's one there's one little line, and I'll try and do my awful Edward Fox doing um, doing <laughs> Horrocks impression. But he's he's like you know this isn't gonna be the pushover everyone thinks, and he's he's like morning morning Alan, you know it's just he's so personable. Like yeah. I love it, I love it. Yeah, shouting to all his yeah. all his like b- battalion commanders. Yeah, like personal man. Yeah. And then he turns to Kane right at the end, and he goes. For God's sake, keep your tanks on the move. It's Fox's delivery. It's how he looks. It's how Kane's playing off him because you can see Kane's inner sort of inner battle of like, look, this might all be well and good, but I've actually got to bloody do it in my hum- Humber Scout car. Yeah. Well, Christ, not us yeah. again. It's the thing, of isn't course. it? Yeah, of course. Yeah, Grenadier Guards had been pasted all. Yeah. We've been at the forefront of Guards' armor yeah. all the way through. Yeah. Um, I, lo- I do love that scene, and I think the analogy of the cavalry and the bad guys is perfect because it's something that would have been understood in 1944, yeah. 1978, yeah. and today. So it's a timeless analogy. It is. So you understand instantly what the aim of the 30, of 30 Corps was was to just push through, and you know, and relieve the the you know the homesteaders. So it's just a very clever sort of like a little analogy. Yeah. I've got a little list here of, of all of the participants that were sort of military consultants, you know, um, that were actually at the battle. We've got Brian Horrocks was was consulted. Gavin was consulted. Uh, John, uh, Joe Bandelure, uh was consulted. John Frost, obviously, and Roy Aircott. So what more can you can you want? And, and obviously, Derek Bogard was was uh, on, on Monty's staff, so knew the intricacies of what would have been going on anyway. Yeah, I think it's interesting. But Bogart says in a in a documentary, he says something like, "The evacuation was the nastiest part of my war, apart from Belson. I didn't like doing it. Didn't like being there." God, you know, he's in, in this documentary. Wow. He's very sort of. You can tell he's not happy about playing Browning because he's sort mm. of. You know, he's very sort of aloof and like, yeah, I don't really think I don't wouldn't have done it like this if I was in charge and sort of. He's trying to subtly say how he feels about playing it. So I wonder how. That got through, you know. That's interesting. Yeah, because Frost writes really well about it as well. I mean, he he, he writes about, you know, the, the, we haven't got the facilities to take your prisoner yeah. scene, how much he hates hated that scene and how it completely misrepresents what happened. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and 
you know, that, that there was an original draft and he really he pushed back ha- quite hard going, you know, this is bullshit. Mm. You know, this we can't put this in the film because there's a, there's even a scene because because what happened is is a sapper got captured, um, you know, in the turn fro around the bridge and um, was asked to take a, a surrender suggestion of surrender to frost and right. was supposed to gave his word that he was going to go back to the germans and he got back got to frost and said, well, i'd rather stay here actually sir thanks very much that's it that's the incident about that that gets turned into we haven't got room to take you uh mm. prisoner we- and and frost you know it's ridiculous yeah. it's an absurd thing and i and i and he really really did not like did not like it in the film, but he talks about how when he first gets there, it's sort of spooking him because it's looks, it's just looks the same. Mm. And, uh, and then, he, and he didn't like these people running around pretending to be him and his men. He didn't like it. He, he thought mm. it was, he thought it was some um, sort of, uh, you know, out of order, transgressive, but in, in, but in the end came round to it and came round to Hopkins and all that sort of thing. But the, I mean, the story about don't run is that, is, you know, the famous story yeah. says, oh, you know, Frost saying to him, you don't run, do you? you walk, you walk, you can't show your men you're afraid. And Hopkins basically mm. thought, well, that's, I can't, that's ridiculous. I'm not doing that. I'm going to run, which I think is quite interesting. In every interview he gives, he always mentions it, but he must have really, must yeah, have really yeah, yeah, yeah. played in his mind, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, the actor deciding that the, bloke who actually did it wrong it's quite funny (laughs) that's show business (laughs) i think that brings us on to final thoughts lads personally for me I'll, i'll kick us off so i have issue i take a little bit of issue because obviously i love this it's the glory i think it's I think it's a better film, but that that's just yeah. personal. Mm-hmm. But my issue is from the sort of minute go to the minute end, the film is playing the blame game and it yeah. doesn't really know whether it wants to lay the blame with Sosoboski or if it wants to lay the blame with Browning. It just knows somewhere the British are to blame somewhere and the Americans are infallible. They save the day and then nothing else happens. So that's an issue for me. But then, you know, and it's obviously limited to its time. My main contentious issue is that you could cut about 40 minutes out of the film and you would have a much tighter experience as a moviegoer and as a we'll back to lyrical about my attention span on the pod. But <laughs> even though I even though I absolutely love it, I did find myself scanning through certain se- certain sections whenever yeah. I watch it. It was two hours fifty long. You know, I know when well, it's- James Kahn comes in, it's time to go make a cup of tea. But it's one of those films, if it were four hours, it would work perfectly. Yes. And if it were two hours, it would work perfectly. It's the sort of, it's the not quite uh, kill your babe, kill your darlings edit where where um, where if it were a leaner film, it would still tell the same story, which is after all the thing it's, it seems most concerned. But then you could still, you could still apportion blame. But uh, you're absolutely right. The moment James Kahn's driving around in a wood. Oh, please. In a, yeah. oh, why, whatever. Yeah. You know, arrest this man for 10 seconds, you know, oh, whatever. I'm going to jump in and defend mm. this this scene. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a moment because I'm not particularly fond of it. So I think, I think the James Kahn scene obviously is uh, probably a contractual requirement in order to get American funding because we need another American scene. That's true. It's just slotted in. There is no link with anyone else in the film. That is the main problem. So my thought is there's no because there's no link to the film, you never see James Kahn's character or the, the young captain's character with anyone else. You could easily cut that out and it would make a great short film on its own. Yeah, it would. So w- without all the rest of, you know, a bridge too far around it, you would have that initial scene where they're introduced. You would have that, that scene where Khan er- for some reason, arrives back at front line. Yeah. Uh, and you know where's the captain he's dead i didn't ask you how he is i asked you where he is which is a great great line this that scene is really well written um and i think i think khan almost sort of like pulls off the the coup of making us care about that character that has zero setup or you know impact on the rest of the story um so i think it would make a good short film on its own so if you cut that out and edited all the scenes with khan in you know, there's some clever things going on in there and it's trying to say, you know, um, the humanity of war is more important than the reality, you know, the, you know, yeah. 
you know the the nature of fighting you know he's promised to his his friend the captain um that he'll you know he'll make sure he gets through it you know and he's keeping that promise uh, I, I think that the way they introduce the captain character is clever. You know, he's he's lying on his bed drinking, and it's sort of you think, oh, it's just just some young enlisted soldier who's, you know, talking to his platoon sergeant, and then you know he puts on his jacket and he's got the bars, and you go, oh, he's a captain, he's the company commander. Yeah. So that's clever. So there's there's elements to that scene that are good, but perhaps because it was needed to, to sort of give it more of an American skew for the, for the American audiences. It may even be, they, they got James Khan and he's going, I'm not going to, I want a thing to myself where I do something like uh, compassionate. He's just been, you know, hard nosed gangsters up to this point, isn't he? Cause of the Godfather and it, and it may, may, may be as simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, apparently De Niro was in line for that role, but he was busy with another film. Um, so it ended up going to Khan and Khan took the role because he liked the scene. Yeah. He liked what was going on in yeah. that scene um yeah but it does it does stop yeah. the film dead in sort of a flow that's the issue the pacing issue i was going to come back to it, it really does kill the film you've got michael Caine and elliot gould saying get the bailey bridges mm. working you know and then and then it cuts to gould being like come on guys let's build the bailey bridge which i also kind of hate because he's, he's i love that scene i love it yeah, he's bossing gould around scenes. british troops and that's not how you treat our lads elliot gould <laughs> <laughs> it annoys me uh, just the way he talks to everyone in that movie he's a very rude man but I think you cut that whole bit out and, and then that scene is a natural that's the natural next yeah. scene it, they, it's like they film this bit for James Caan they don't know where to put it in so they just stuff it in no I think you exa- I think you bang on there I think they didn't know quite where to put it and it just sort of slotted yeah. in between those two scenes and on my most recent rewatch it you know it occurred to me it literally fades to black yeah that that scene doesn't fade into another scene. It fades to black and a new scene starts. Yeah. So you can quite clearly see in the edit where they've gone, okay, we're gonna put Khan's you know, Jeep ride here, and that's it. You know, so you can definitely see where they possibly you could say shoehorned it in. Yeah, it does feel that way. Mm. It does feel that way. I, I said earlier on, I'm gonna have to watch this again. And that's the actually the the, the thing about this movie is it does it has does and has borne repeated viewings uh, somehow. Um, and there, there is always something uh, something more in it each time I watch it, oddly, oddly enough. That in itself, for a, for a history movie, a true story history movie, epic 1970s anti-war war film, that's, a heck, that's qu- quite an achievement. Because it doesn't, f- the other thing I think is quite interesting, it doesn't feel all that dated. Not, or not... Or, no. Or, well, no, it does feel dated, but not in a way that makes you go, oh, God, I can't watch this. In the way that, um, you know, in Waterloo, the bloke running out and going, why, why? Oh, for heaven's sake. Oh, oh you yeah, know, that's, that, yeah. yeah. That's like the worst, yeah. worst, uh, uh, that's a movie destroying scene. And it doesn't, it doesn't feel dated in that sense. And I think that's, that's a heck of a thing. And that's why I will go and that's why I will probably watch it again this afternoon when I should be doing something else <laughs> more worthwhile. <laughs> Thanks, lads. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Yeah, tweet. Join us. Just tweet it out, and we'll, we'll do a live stream. We'll do a live watch. We'll do a tweet along. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. You know, it is for its flaws. It's so bloody watchable, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You know, you almost have to book out your afternoons. It's so bloody long. Testament to Amber's yeah. directing, really. Yeah. I think, and and Unsworth's cinematography. Yeah. I, I I feel that somewhere there is a, a theirs is the glory. Um, a bridge too far super cut that would make the perfect Arnhem yeah. film, but alas, no one's no one's done it yet. But I think you know if you do if you took it back to the editing block, chopped it up a little bit, you would just have that lovely tight little film that they didn't that Roger Ebert certainly didn't watch in in 1977. Yeah. Mm, definitely, you know, and it will turn it will eternally always be that sort of bank holiday, right? Of the, the kids are the kids are outside running around like mad. But I've got a crate of beers and I've got a bridge too far. Leave me the fuck alone. <laughs> I'm going to watch it. I think for me, I think it's an epic in the truest sense of the word. And we'll probably not see it's like again. Uh, we, we've seen efforts, you know, from uh, Michael Bay with Pearl Harbor yeah. and Midway. They just don't pay off the same way as, you know, these, these films like A Bridge Too Far. 
and you know it's for all the elements that we've already discussed and there's a thousand things we haven't talked about that we could have talked about mm. just you know from this one film and as i said it's it's an epic in the truest sense that's testament to it isn't it yeah yeah and, and i think the true you know legacy of the film is that it's fired the imagination of so many people yeah you know al was talking at the beginning of the pod about how you know it inspired his interest in military history you know and i remember watching it as a kid and thinking bloody hell this is this is fucking amazing yeah like, yeah you know yeah. You, you sat there and you just get these set pieces you get these brilliant performances from f- some phenomenal actors um and then you find out it's a true story you know, at the end of it all and you you know you, you're thinking bloody hell that's a true story you know then mm. you, i went away and you know did some reading and you know it's just it's one of those films that grabs you and like a proper nucleus moment isn't it a proper yeah it is and it it it's it's just a film that sort of sparks the imagination and fires interest. And I think that's that's the real uh, legacy of Bridge Too Far. So I think on that note, chaps, that probably wraps us up for today. So thanks, Al Murray, for coming on. We are so, we're so happy you can be My on. total pleasure. I could talk about this uh, stuff forever. Part two coming up next week, guys. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll, we'll definitely have to have you on Al uh, I wonder if you had another personal favourite movie we could have you back on oh I'll think I'll, I'll, I'll give that some thought I'd, but I'd love to yeah thanks so much yeah. for coming Al it's been an absolute blast a total pleasure boys don't forget to drop us a like a subscription a written review whatever you're listening on and we will catch you again in the next one thanks for listening guys cheerio bye bye bye